Right now on Morning News Now, a war of words on the campaign trail between President Biden at a star-studded fundraiser in L.A. and former President Trump rallying voters in Battleground, Michigan. The next president is likely to have two new Supreme Court nominees. If he's reelected, he's going to appoint two more flying flags upside down. He's the worst president in the, history, in the history of our country. The most important thing we have to do, we have to save our country because our country is in trouble. We have team coverage of what the candidates think is at stake this November. Also, we are feeling the heat. This morning, heat alerts in effect across several states with triple-digit temperatures expected through the week that will impact millions. We're tracking the conditions, the dangers, and what to expect where you live. Plus, is your dream home out of reach? With high interest rates and high demand, many younger Americans say it is. But there is some hope for house hunters. We'll get you expert advice. And Inside Out 2 coming out on top at the box office with the second highest theatrical opening for an animated film ever. More on the big domestic debut that's giving the movie industry a much needed boost. I have not seen it, but I can't wait. I know. It's been a slow start to the box office of the fact that that drove people to the theaters. We'll talk more about what that means. Eating out means. everything else that's come out this year. Dune 2, all these other things. Exactly. Good to have you with us on this Monday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We get started this morning on the presidential campaign trail with both President Biden and former President Donald Trump ramping up their efforts to rally voters as we move closer to the November election. The Biden campaign says it raised more more than $30 million over the weekend at a celebrity-filled fundraiser held in Los Angeles. The president spoke to a star-studded crowd featuring some famous faces. Former President Barack Obama, George Clooney, Julia Roberts, and Jimmy Kimmel were all there. Mr. Biden discussed major policy issues while also touching on the possible consequences of a second Trump term in office. As for Mr. Trump, he campaigned in Michigan hoping to sway black voters. The former president spoke to potential voters at a Detroit church before holding a larger rally later in the day. Michigan is a key battleground state. Mr. Biden won it by less than three points just four years ago, while Mr. Trump narrowly won it in 2016. Our political team is here to recap this weekend's events, including NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard and NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen. Let's begin with NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa. Ali, good to have you with us. So this is President Biden's second VIP packed fundraising event this year. The last one just a few months ago across the street here in New York mm. at Radio City. How did this one compare to his first one? What was the main message during this weekend's event? Yeah, guys, good morning. Well, that star-studded fundraiser back in March in New York City uh, with the president brought in uh, $26 million. This uh, fundraiser this weekend in California outraised that, according to the Biden campaign, bringing in more than $30 million. And during this fundraiser, the president uh, had a wide-ranging conversation with Jimmy Kimmel, as well as former President Obama, hitting on a lot of issues. They talked about misinformation uh, um, on social media from the president's uh, G7 summit in Italy last week. Uh, they also talked about what he sees as his achievements during his first year in office, what he would do if he wins another term uh, in the White House. Uh, and he also made the case for what he would do if reelected, especially contrasting that with uh, what former President Trump has said he would do if he gets another term in the White House. And all of this is in an effort to really keep momentum building as we enter this critical stretch of the campaign, all part of an effort uh, to really counter these low approval ratings that we've seen for the president, as well as uh, concerns about his age, you guys. Ali, one of the things that the president really zeroed in on when it comes to contrasting the two seats on the Supreme Court, he started to make that a campaign issue. What did he say? Yeah, the president has usually shied away from uh, denouncing or slamming the actual Supreme Court itself, but he has not been shy about denouncing specific decisions that the court has made. And that really took a turn uh, during this fundraiser. Some of his sharpest remarks were about the Supreme Court. He said that the next president will likely get to nominate two justices, calling that reality scary and saying that this right-leaning court is out of step with Americans. As you'll remember, his predecessor nominated three of the six conservative justices who now control the nine-member court. Uh, and we have some audio uh, from his uh, fundraiser. Take a listen to part of that. Elect me again. I'll tell you why. No, I'm not just saying. The next president is likely to have two new Supreme Court nominees. Two more. Two more. 
The idea that if he's reelected, he's going to appoint two more flying flags upside down is really I, I, I really mean it. The Supreme Court has never been as out of kilter as it is today. I mean, never. The president in those comments referring to the controversy around uh, Justice Alito, who uh, allowed flags associated with the effort to overturn the 2020 election to be flown outside of two of his homes. So all of this really uh, a much sharper approach, a much sharper uh, attacks from uh, President Biden on the issue of the Supreme Court. I mean, yeah, Ali, sticking with that, it's been nearly two years since Roe versus Wade was overturned. The Biden administration is looking to mark the date by holding dozens of events focused on reproductive rights across key battleground states. What is the strategy here? Yeah, and we've seen the White House really lean into that decision almost two years ago uh, over the last two years. We are expecting that to continue and really only sharpen uh, in the coming week as we approach the two-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Biden campaign saying that it plans to mark that anniversary by barnstorming battleground states, sending the president, the vice president, surrogates, celebrities, all across battleground states like Nevada, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, really calling attention to the personal stories of people who have been impacted by that decision and really reminding Americans of what they say is at stake if uh, former President Trump wins another term in the White House. And you'll remember that anniversary comes just days before President uh, Biden and former President Trump are set to face off uh, for the first time on the general election debate stage. So the Biden campaign says that they plan to use this opportunity to talk about the stakes of the election as well as remind Americans of what former President Trump has said uh, about abortion, you guys. All right, Allie Rafa kicking us off this hour. Allie, thank you. Well, let's take a closer look at the Supreme Court piece of this. As we mentioned, President Biden said he thinks, quote, one of the scariest parts of Donald Trump potentially getting reelected would be the possibility for Mr. Trump to appoint two more Supreme Court justices. The president pointed out that during his term in the White House, Mr. Trump appointed conservative justices who played a pivotal role in overturning Roe versus Wade. NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen joins us with more on this. John, good morning. So Supreme Court justices, they are on the bench for life once they are appointed. Do you think... This is a motivating issue for voters. Do seats on the court get people out to the polls? Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joe. And Joe, by the way, amazing suit. You're killing it this morning with that <laughs> uh, with that collar. <laughs> right? You can borrow it, John. Just Joe let me know when you need it. I'm talking yeah. to Joe Fire. <laughs> What'd you say, Joe Fire? <laughs> Cute. Uh, but, but let's go back to the let's go back to the Supreme Court for a minute. Uh, yeah, I think voters really care about who's on the Supreme Court. Not always, but certainly in the wake of uh, the Dobbs decision, you can see why there are many voters, both those who uh, who support abortion rights, uh, reproductive rights, and those uh, who want to see abortion ended, who understand very much the importance of who's on that court. So absolutely a voting issue in 2024. I mean, when you look across the broad spectrum of issues that people take into account, you got the economy, foreign policy, the border, things like that. How strong an argument is President Biden making for his own reelection by focusing on the Supreme Court? We know it's worked at the state level over the last two years for Democrats, but how about on the national level? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, it's, it's big with, um, with his base. It may be, help, be able to help him uh, get some people who might not otherwise have voted, uh, but who were charged up about the court, particularly over that Dobbs decision to get out to the polls. Uh, I'm generally of the view that if you're talking about persuadable voters, the economy is the biggest issue, not by a little bit, not by a bit, but by a, a ton. Um, you know, if he is uh, uh, talking about other issues than the economy, he may be uh, missing opportunities to persuade voters. And, you know, the other question here with what he said about the Supreme Court is, uh, it could be two justices. It could be no justices. It could be nine justices, unless he's, um, you know, sitting up in heaven with God, you know, making <laughs> making calls or foreseeing when people are going to die or retire. He really doesn't know. And Clarence Thomas and uh, Samuel Alito are the two justices he is presumably talking about with the upside down flying flags. Uh, they are both younger than Joe Biden, uh, not only now, but they're, they will be younger at the end of the next presidential term than Joe Biden is now. Mm. So there could be a lot of pressure on them to retire because they are all older justices, but there is no uh, mandate for them to do so. And, uh, you know, compared to the president, they're, they're spry 
uh, 74 and 75 year olds respectively. I know we just dug in on, on the particular picks of Trump being part of what overturned Roe v. Wade, but just remind us, both Biden and Trump's track record when it comes to Supreme Court appointments. So Trump's is shorter. Uh, of course, he was uh, you know, president for four years and uh, appointed Brett Kavanaugh and uh, appointed Neil Gorsuch and appointed uh, um, Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, and he has um, you know, basically used the court as a way to prove himself to conservatives um, you know, not just uh, with those picks, but in his rhetoric, he is and in his uh, decision making, having put out lists in the past of who he might put on the court and then picking from those lists. Joe Biden has a much longer record with the Supreme Court. He was at one point chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, and, and has overseen these things before. So uh, they both have a lot to talk about. All right, John Allen, thank you very much. A cranberry colored suit is on the way to you in the mail. <laughs> All right, the presumptive Republican presidential nominee, Mr. Trump, headlined the Turning Point Action Convention in downtown Detroit on Saturday. This marks the second time in two weeks that the former president has headlined an event organized by the conservative group. Mr. Trump also took part in an outreach event at a predominantly black church, claiming that President Biden was, quote, the worst president for black people and making the argument that the black community was being most impacted by illegal immigration. Joining us now, NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard. Von, good morning. So we know Turning Point has become one of the most cons most active conservative organizations in the country. It's closely tied with the Trump campaign. Mr. Trump's speech over the weekend lasted nearly an hour and a half. Any headlines come out of this? You know, guys, this for Donald Trump here, Michigan was a state right, that he lost in 2020 by about 150,000 votes. So he has to make inroads among several different communities. And one of those communities could very well be black voters, particularly in the greater Dem Detroit area, where he made these remarks here over the course of this weekend. And you saw him focus on not only the idea that the election was stolen from him, continually repeating that and coming back to that and uh, making himself out to be a sympathetic figure you're in American politics today, four and a half months out from the election. But you also heard him talk about the opportunity zones, which were created in low income communities. The, this was legislation that was passed back in 2017. It was shepherded through the US Congress in part by Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, who is one of those individuals who is up for VP consideration. Uh, he is somebody as a black man who could potentially uh, uh, be an asset to him as a running mate. And you saw the likes of Byron Donalds, a Florida congressman, another black man who uh, in part helped introduce Donald Trump over the weekend, is somebody who is also potentially a VP pick here. And so for not only Turning Point, but the Trump campaign, they see Michigan as a place and an opportunity to try over the course of the next four and a half, four and a half months to drill home a message, uh, not only an economic one, but also one that uh, uh, reflects to a greater part of the uh, American electorate that they believe they can make an inroads among. And Vaughn, tell us about some of the other Republican politicians who spoke at this convention and, and if any of this was a sense of anybody making their case to be Mr. Trump's running mate. Right, absolutely, with Tim Scott, Byron Donalds, but you also had the likes of J.D. Vance, who was the Ohio senator, who he was asked the direct question from that turning point stage there about potentially being his VP. And he made it clear that whether it's him or anybody else, the goal come 2025 for Republicans must be to work with other Republicans and unite in an effort to push through legislation and get it to what would be President Trump's desk. And, you know, this this is a refrain that I often hear from uh, among folks when they reflect on Donald Trump's first term is that there were too many individuals who were blocking the efforts and that the Republicans need to coalesce in support and that Donald Trump should be the leader of that. And so when you see somebody like a J.D. Vance, who was a one time critic of Donald Trump and called himself even a never Trumper eight years ago, it's that sort of messaging that Donald Trump wants to hear from his potential running mate. So, Bon, when we talk about Mr. Trump trying to make his case to black voters, what is his pitch and are there any signs it's actually resonating? Right, I think that that's the question. Are there signs that it's resonating? If you go to, you know, look at some of the crowds for his rallies, there's definitely more diversity than we have seen in years past. And polling would suggest 
that he could very well make a dent among black America. He did, in the 2020 election, receive about 12 percent of support among uh, uh, black voters, which was a record for any GOP nominee dating back decades. And so he had already shown uh, a, a, an ability to win over at least a portion of the black electorate. However, you know, in order to make a, a, a really sizable dent and really make an impact in a state like Michigan here, he's going to have to perform better. And so Donald Trump has uh, consistently tried to make an appeal that he is, you know, a, 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 is a candidate who is able to reach a more diverse subsect of the American electorate. Yet we have seen over the last two election cycles, Donald Trump repeatedly struggle to make that sort of an impact or those sort of inroads. So he's hoping that 2024, uh, with a more direct message, uh, it, it gives him the opportunity to do that. All right, Von Hilliard, thank you very much. Well, we have breaking news from Israel this morning where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced he has disbanded his war cabinet with no plans to replace the coalition. It comes just a week after cabinet member Benny Gantz left along with two other members. The coalition was initially created just days after the October 7th attack to manage the campaign against Hamas. Netanyahu is expected to get final approval for future war decisions from the wider security cabinet. Meanwhile, Israel's military says it will be pausing all fighting during daylight hours to get long-awaited humanitarian aid into Gaza. NBC News international correspondent Rav Sanchez has the details. Hey there, a major shakeup in Israel today as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announces he is dissolving the war cabinet that has been responsible for managing the war in Gaza these last eight months. Now remember, this unity cabinet was kind of a team of rivals. It included Netanyahu's political rivals who joined the Israeli government just after the October 7th attacks. They have now resigned from that body, saying they disagree with Netanyahu's vision for the future of the war, and the cabinet itself has now been dissolved. Now, this comes amid tensions between the Israeli government and the Israeli military over humanitarian aid inside of Gaza. The Israeli military announcing over the weekend it is putting in place these daily pauses of 11 hours to allow more humanitarian aid in through a specific area. This is eastern Rafah near the Kerem Shalom crossing. The far right of Benjamin Netanyahu's government is blasting this decision. They say there should be less aid going to civilians in Gaza, not more. They say whoever made the decision to allow the aid in is a fool who should not be allowed to stay in his position. And an Israeli official is saying that Prime Minister Netanyahu himself apparently was unaware of this decision. He says it's unacceptable and that the fighting will continue in other areas of Rafa, specifically the west of that region near the coast as previously planned. Now, all of this is happening during the Islamic holiday of Eid. You have families in Gaza who are trying to celebrate what is supposed to be a time of happiness when parents buy their children new clothes, when families get together. And instead, this is a holiday being celebrated among the horrors of war. Mm. Back to you. Raf, thank you very much. Get ready. The forecast calls for some dangerously high temps to scorch states from coast to coast this week. Yeah, this morning, millions of Americans are waking up under heat alerts as extreme weather is forecasted to hit major cities across the country, with temperatures expected to reach 10 to 25 degrees above normal through Friday and beyond. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Detroit, which is one of those areas. Maggie, good morning from where you are to the Midwest, to the East Coast, to Denver, Phoenix, out West. <laughs> temps expected to soar near triple yeah. digits. First of all, what's the weather like where you are this morning? Oh, guys, it's just perfect for heat <laughs> coverage, isn't it? Look at this rain. This is exactly what you want when your producers decide that we're going to do this from Detroit. But this is kind of a flukish front that's moving through and speaks to sort of the insanity that's expected to be this week when it comes to weather because we have temperatures set to soar into the mid to upper 90s later on today. So we are welcoming this here in Detroit because this is kind of the last gasp of relief before temperatures here. And as you point out, across much of the U.S., soar to as much as 20 to 25 degrees 
degrees above average. And keep in mind, guys, the summer solstice is later on this week, meaning summer hasn't even officially started yet, and we're already off and running, clearly. Maggie, we've seen this heat for a while now. The south has been baking in Atlanta. Temperatures reached mid-upper yeah. 90s over the weekend already. That's the hottest the city has seen so far this year and quite early. How have people been managing right. in this heat? I mean, a lot of people told us that their Father's Day celebrations yesterday were exclusively indoors. Like if they had any plans to go out and go for like a walk or a hike or dad wants to go play golf. A lot of those plans were canceled yesterday with people just kind of resigning themselves to going to a movie or having a nice meal inside. Those are great things. But they said it was kind of a last minute change as this heat wave rolled in and really caught everybody off guard. This is the first major heat wave of 2024. And the thing that about this that is so key is the National Weather Service says it's supposed to be some of the longest or one of the longest heat waves a lot of parts of the country have ever seen. We're talking about a really stubborn heat dome that, as you point out, may last into the weekend for a lot of places. And it really came up fast for a lot of people. So they're adjusting quickly, for sure. And we know what these temps can mean for folks on the West Coast. We already see the high temperatures fueling wildfires in California. Mm -hmm. What's the latest there? Yeah. The latest there is that there are multiple and firefighters really have their hands full, you know, and we feel like we see this every year. And we're again, just that phrase off and running uh, already this season. We're watching one in Gorman, California, that's north of L.A. I believe it's already more uh, than 15,000 acres. And over the weekend, it forced a thousand people to evacuate from a nearby state park there. And then there's another one up in wine country that's also been raging throughout the weekend, raging for days. Firefighters getting a handle on that one, which is obviously great news to hear. But you're right. This heat, these temperatures, uh, the dryness already having that impact out west. And now we're kind of seeing it uh, slowly moving as this dome expands across the entire country, guys. All right. Maggie Vespa, stay cool and stay dry. Yes, exactly. That's a lot of fun. All right. While you try to cool off, <laughs> we're going to keep our heat coverage going with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. We're staying cool and dry. Good morning, Michelle. <laughs> Hi there, guys. Yeah, it's really cool in the studio. And uh, it's going to stay cool because it's always been cool here. But we are looking at dangerous heat as we go throughout the week, as Maggie said. She mentioned those daytime highs. They are going to be drastic with 10, 25 degrees above normal. And it's going to be a long duration. But also at night, we're not going to get that relief. That's when it gets particularly dangerous. So coast to coast heat as we go throughout the next five days. That's where you see all this red coloring here. And we're going to see 264 million Americans with temperatures above 90 degrees this week. And as Maggie mentioned, summer doesn't arrive until Thursday. So waking up this morning or walking out the door, I should say, 66 million people impacted by heat alerts today. We're looking at heat advisories. That's in the orange. Heat warnings in that lighter pink and the darker pink, almost red, is a heat watch. So all the way from the Midwest to the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes, into the Northeast and some parts of New England. Now remember, some parts of New England, you don't have air conditioning. You typically don't need it very often, but we're looking at temperatures soaring this week. So that's particularly dangerous as well. Look at some of these temperatures today. We're going to break records. We're looking at 91 degrees in some spots, 97 in Chicago, 93 in Indianapolis. The record there is 95. Columbus, 94. Syracuse even 93 degrees. The record there is 93. So we'll see how many records we break over the next five days. Then tomorrow, same story. This is where we really start to see that heat pump uh, kick into the northeast. Now, these are the air temperatures. You factor in the humidity in a lot of spots. It will feel like over 100 degrees, especially by Thursday and Friday. So by tomorrow, Cleveland, 94, 97 in Syracuse, 95 in Newark. The record there is 97, 90 in Bangor, Maine, and we're looking at 91 degrees in Boston. And then there's no relief as we go throughout the late week. We're looking at temperatures well into the 90s, near 100 degrees in Syracuse on Thursday, into the 90s in New York City, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Friday is going to be a tough day because it will feel like over 100 degrees there in Boston. We're looking at temperatures, too, into the upper 90s. So a dangerous heat wave. We talk about these numbers. Where does it correspond to how we're feeling, the effects on us? Just looking, looking at the color corresponding here, where you see the purple, that is an extreme risk. So portions of the Midwest into the Great Lakes, parts of New England, the interior parts of the Northeast as well. If you're outside for a long duration, and there's a lot of people who need to work outdoors, that can be deadly. If you don't hydrate, if you don't take uh, cover under shade, you need to heed all the warnings that we hear. And this is why we have these heat, we heat alerts in place. The National Weather Service is giving us a heads up that we need to take action at least through this week, especially through the later part of this week. This is going to prompt more dry uh, weather in portions of the southwest. So a fire threat does continue. 12 million people impacted where you see the pink. That is not the only story. This is going to be another big story as well. We have 
tropical moisture could become a tropical uh, system as we go throughout this week. Where a low is going to develop in the Gulf, we're going to see tropical moisture moving across the Gulf Coast states. We could see up to eight inches in some spots. Wow. So we're going to watch that very closely as well. And then we have a severe weather threat in portions of the Plains and also the Midwest. Okay, a Welcome busy week for you. Yeah, you know, <laughs> oh, and also accumulating snow in the Northern Rockies today. Oh. Uh, Slates, right? What? Accumulating snow. There's winter storm warnings in the nor northern Rockies. Oh, okay. Oh, in goodness. June. At the same time June that is nearby June. is fire warnings. I know. That is crazy. Really right. scary. All right. Thank yeah. you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Sure. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, a strong stance from the Surgeon General about kids and social media. Why he says a warning label should be required when you scroll. Up first, after the break, though, flight risk. What we're learning about not one, but two more mid-air emergencies that are fueling fears about flying. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, with a busy summer travel season now kicking into high gear, we are learning about two more recent terrifying midair incidents. One plane coming close to slamming into the ocean and another going into an uncontrolled roll mid-flight. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has the details. It was a very close call off Kauai in April. The FAA confirming it's investigating a southwest flight that came within 400 feet of slamming into the ocean while attempting to land in bad weather. A southwest memo to pilots says a less experienced first officer inadvertently pushed the control column forward, then cut the speed, causing cockpit alarms to go off before the captain ordered an aggressive climb. No injuries. Southwest tells NBC News nothing is more important than and safety. The event was addressed appropriately as we always strive for continuous improvement. Meanwhile, the NTSB is investigating another incident that happened in May on a Southwest flight from Phoenix to Oakland. At 34,000 feet, the 737 MAX 8 suddenly went into what pilots call a Dutch roll, oscillating and rocking from side to side. Pilots regained control and landed safely. A post-flight inspection revealed damage to the standby power control unit that provides backup power to the rudder. The FAA says it has no reports of similar problems involving other 737 MAXs. I don't think we have a fleet problem here. There's something unique to this airplane, and that's what the investigators are going to concentrate on. And another concern, the FAA looking at whether potentially counterfeit titanium from China made its way into the Boeing and Airbus supply chains with forged documents. Boeing flagged the concern to the FAA. Both Boeing and Airbus say there's no sign that any aircraft was made with suspect titanium. Does the FAA have enough inspectors right now to truly keep an eye on Boeing. We feel like we have enough inspectors, but we continue to hire and train more inspectors. Our thanks to Tom Costello for that report. Well, this all comes as the TSA predicts it could screen a record number of passengers just this week, screening up to 3 million people in a single day. International headlines now, starting with a renewed plea for peace in Ukraine at a weekend summit in Switzerland. Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. Well, that's right. That final document signed by 78 countries say essentially that the UN Charter as well as the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine should be at the basis of any just and lasting peace in Ukraine. But the demand for territorial integrity clashed with Vladimir Putin's claim ahead of that summit that the war will not end until Ukraine withdraws from four provinces that Russia claims to have annexed. But Kyiv, as well as its Western allies, said that's not a peace offering, but a request to surrender. Now to the disputed South China Sea, where a collision between a Chinese vessel and a Philippine supply ship is the latest in the territorial feud. Now, Chinese officials say the Philippines is entirely responsible for this, adding they dangerously approached the, the Chinese ship in an unprofessional manner and ignored warnings. The Philippine military say the claims are deceptive and misleading. And we finish up with the end of an era. During her 100th show of the era tour in Liverpool, England, Taylor Swift shared with her fans that she will conclude her tour in December of this year, presumably after her show in Vancouver on December the 8th. The Eras tour has been a global phenomenon. It, be it began in March of last year and has been expanded and extended multiple times, allowing Swift to perform for her fans around the world. Back to you guys. Mm. I think she's earned a little time off. Yeah, no kidding. 100 shows. Now it's like 103 yeah. even since she did that. <laughs> Three hours a night. It's wild. And still so much more to go. All right.
right, Claudio, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a renewed fight over reproductive rights in America as one of the most influential groups votes against IVF treatment. More on this latest show and how it could impact the election. Plus, a Hollywood actress giving back to kids in her hometown by offering a space they can call their own. We'll explain what's behind these so-called calming cottages next on Morning News Now. We're back with a political flashpoint that's turning into a hot button topic in Congress, in vitro fertilization. Just this weekend, one of the most influential Christian organizations in the U.S. voted against the procedure, which has become incredibly popular. In fact, federal stats show millions of children were born with the help of IVF in the last few years. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin spoke to one woman who says IVF changed her life. Julie Eshelman says IVF is the reason she has a family. She is our little miracle and our rainbow, and we love her to pieces. But because her husband works in the military and they move to different states frequently, often to places beyond their control, she worries about how the political climate and access to IVF will impact her chances at another baby. I shouldn't have to worry about IVF being legal, about being able to get care if something were to go wrong with my pregnancy. This week, the Southern Baptist Convention, the nation's largest Protestant denomination, passed a resolution against the current use of in vitro fertilization. The eyes have it, and the resolution is adopted. The non-binding vote came after some delegates shared personal stories of lives enriched by IVF. I have... Ten embryos that I love, and with every bit of my being, we will have or see born into a Christian family. Roughly 60% voted in favor of the resolution, which calls out IVF for routinely generating more embryos than can be safely implanted. IVF is a huge problem inherently. Albert Moeller helped draft the resolution. Is that a call to political action? Of course it is. Would my goal be to see this result in legislative action? The answer has to be yes. The vote comes just months after the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that embryos should be considered children, leading clinics within the state to temporarily pause treatment. Infertility is a major problem in the U.S., impacting 9% of married women. According to a recent Gallup poll, 82% of Americans believe IVF to be morally acceptable. But they do remain divided over the disposal of non-viable embryos created during treatment. <laughs> IVF now a political flashpoint, with Senate Democrats this week backing a bill that would protect nationwide access to the treatment. For so many women, that lifelong hope of having children is now stuck in a hellish limbo. While Senate Republicans put forward a narrower bill, accusing Democrats of fear-mongering on the issue. Now, the tragic situation in Alabama has been used to fear-monger and scare that IVF is somehow in jeopardy. And that is not true. Both bills blocked by the other party. Eshelman, an advocate for IVF, was invited onto the Senate floor by the Democrats. Sitting there listening to the senator from Louisiana saying that these fears were made up as a patient that literally had to wait for the dust to settle because I didn't know whether or not we would be able to legally pursue IVF and that our embryos would be safe. Like, it was insulting to me. She says she just wants the freedom to grow her family, regardless of what state they live in. People just want to be able to have the opportunity to become parents. Why would you tell somebody that's suffering from infertility that they can't use this medicine to help solve their disease? Our thanks to Erin McLaughlin for that report. Well, students in Allentown, Pennsylvania, looking for a calming place at school now have somewhere to unwind thanks to some alumni, including actress Amanda Seyfried. NBC News digital reporter Maya Eaglin talked to the actress about her passion for this off-screen project. Actor Amanda Seyfried might be known for her hit Hollywood blockbusters like Les Mis, Mamma Mia, and Mean Girls. It's like I have ESPN or something. But now she's on a mission to give back to her hometown of Allentown, Pennsylvania by bringing mindfulness to schools. Breathe in, breathe out. In a unique way. We all grow up taking these cardboard boxes and making them into whatever we want. We've taken... Um, it a little step further. Amanda's one of the co-creators of Make It Cute, and their cardboard playhouses provide a safe place for school children. 
it's a space these kids recognize as something that, that's theirs and they have their autonomy and hopefully that makes them feel safe to be able to explore their own feelings and 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 then communicate. Seifred and the company's two other creators grew up together. I was able to be a part of the delivery of the playhouses and it was just such a special day. Now, with the help of a donation from a local state farm office and the Mindful Child Initiative, Make It Cute has been able to place these playhouses in 14 Allentown schools, transforming them into calming cottages. The students at Central Elementary School finding comfort within these cardboard cottages. School counselor Aaron Rogers says the cottages have become a key tool for kids to manage stress and control emotions. Students have told me before that they feel themselves starting to get angry. They actually have stopped and thought about it and thought, well, you know, how am I feeling? What can I do to calm myself down right now? Two, you could go in, relax, take a deep breath, do mindfulness, Play with the teddy bears. One study by the National Institutes of Health found that schools that incorporate mindfulness saw a decrease in students' anxiety and attention problems. And in Allentown, mindfulness has even had an impact outside of school. There was a shooting um, at our local mall a few years ago. One of the kids and her family was brought into a store like in a back room and she came in and told her counselor, I used mindfulness during the lockdown at the shooting. Why do you think mindfulness is important for children to practice, especially right now? Mindfulness is pulling yourself back in to what's real. When we teach our kids these things at an earlier age, hopefully they're, they're, they're being taught how to manage their anxiety. If we can teach our kids anything, it's how to feel safe in themselves. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. Coming up, a sharp stance from the Surgeon General about the dangers of social media for teens, why he's urging action to better protect young people when they scroll. Plus, on the market, but out of reach, more and more house hunters discouraged by the current real estate market. But there's hope. We'll get some advice on how to land your dream home. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. This morning, the Surgeon General is proposing a new way to address a growing concern, the harm that social media poses to teens. He says it's time to put a warning label on all platforms stating that social media is associated with significant mental health risks for adolescents. A little earlier this morning, Dr. Vivek Murthy spoke exclusively to Savannah Guthrie over on Today about his suggested approach. Here's some of that conversation. Parents are struggling all over the country. I've spent time with thousands of parents over the last few years all over America. And the number one question they often ask me about is social media. They want to know, is this safe for my kids? How should I manage it? And what the data is telling us, Savannah, is not only have companies not demonstrated that their platforms are safe for kids, but there is growing evidence of harm. It shows us, in fact, that when adolescents spend more than three hours a day on social media, we're seeing an association with a doubling of risk of anxiety and depression symptoms. And the average amount of use per day among adolescents is nearly five hours. So that's deeply concerning to me, not just as Surgeon General, but as a parent myself. Now, a warning label would help parents to understand these risks. Many parents don't know that those risks exist. And we have data from tobacco warning labels that, in fact, tells us that they can be helpful in changing awareness and changing behavior. Keep in mind, when Congress uh, authorized these labels for tobacco uh, more than half a century ago, or nearly half a century ago, the smoking rate in America was above 40 percent. Today, it's under 12 percent. That's an extraordinary amount of progress. Labels were a part of that effort. Our thanks to Savannah Guthrie and our friends at Today for bringing us that conversation. It is time now for some money news. If you're a Disney fan and you bought one of the company's Dream Key Passes, you might want to keep an eye on your mail. CNBC's Savannah Hanau has that and some other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to you. So Disney is mailing out checks in its nine and a half million dollar settlement over its dream key passes. Now, the fourteen hundred dollar passes allegedly allowed guests to make reservations at Disneyland and California Adventure theme parks without additional charge for a year with no dates blacked out. But a pass holder later filed a lawsuit saying customers weren't allowed to use the pass on weekends in the entirety of November 2021. 
Disney has denied wrongdoing, but agreed to settle to avoid a trial. More than 100,000 people who bought the pass between August 25th and October 25th, 2021, will receive about $67. Online personalized vitamin company Care Of announced it will cancel all subscriptions as of today and no longer accept new orders. The closure isn't a huge surprise though. The company previously disclosed to the New York Labor Department it would lay off all 143 employees by July 3rd due to a funding loss. The company did not disclose um, the door on return, however, saying it is exploring options for the brand, but does not have anything definitive to share right now. And New Yorkers looked up this weekend to see a massive dragon perched on the Empire State Building. Well, it's a marketing stunt for Max's second season of the Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon, which dropped its first episode last night. Now, the dragon was fittingly made by bigger than life advertising for a week long takeover. He is 270 feet and is fixed into place by more than 150 rigging points, guys. Very I, cool. I want to know if there were any 911 calls. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, probably, like, so... probably. I'm surprised it was allowed. They're dragon. like, sure, go ahead. Throw right? a dragon up yeah, there. Yeah, hang a dragon up <laughs> yeah. there. All right, thanks, Silvana. <laughs> June is National Home Ownership Month, but for many young people, that American dream of buying your first home has seemed more and more unattainable. Yeah, a recent Gallup poll found that the cost of owning or renting a home ranks second among top financial problems facing families. And navigating the shifting real estate market can be a daunting task for anyone. That's why we want to bring in real estate broker and founder of the Masters Division at Nest Seekers International, Bianca D'Alessio. Good to have you with us. So this is not the ideal formula. Interest rates no. and demand <laughs> high, supply low. A yes. lot of young people might be wondering, is this American dream of home ownership even possible? Of course it's possible. The American dream is always possible. It's just going to take a little bit more time and patience mm. in order for people to be able to enter the market and a lot more saving and planning than it used to before. Yeah, so let's talk about what we see right now. Like with the way the market looks, everybody's always wondering, should I buy now? Should I wait? Should I hold off a little longer? Yep. We don't think interest rates are going to come down for a while. Does that mean you keep hanging on? What do you think? Interest rates are not going to come down, in my personal opinion, based on what we're seeing in the market. And prices are definitely not going to come down because we don't see construction happening at mm. a pace fast enough to be uh, replenishing the supply that's needed to meet the demand. So I think we're going to be in this position for a very long time. So if you're interested in buying in the next one year or two years, you should be in the market now, mm. educating yourself, learning, exploring, and saving so you could plan for that purchase. What should first time homeowners be looking for right now? And how should you set your expectations? <laughs> <laughs> expectations, that is the key. <laughs> um, Planning and buying a home looks much different than it used to because homeowners do have to make some concessions and adjustments to what they're able to afford right now. So being able to know what are my needs versus my wants, where can I expand geographically, what does my timeline actually look like, and what do I need to do in my personal life to actually be saving so I can afford it. There's no doubt that owning a home today is far more expensive mm. than it was just a few years ago, not even talking about our parents, just a few years ago. So it's really important to start uh, saving and being really strategic with how you're living your life so you could afford that dream. I grew up with my grandma claiming that renting was like flushing money down the toilet. You know, it's like you got to own as soon as you can. But we are seeing in certain cities and certain markets that kind of tip a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe Absolutely. you should look at if renting does make more sense for you than owning just right now. There's a lot of senses in a lot of cities where renting does make more sense right now. It's all about what is your financial goals and your financial planning that looks different for every single person and in their family planning journey. What does that look like for mm -hmm. what space? they want to be in and what's the most comfortable for them. Mm. Right. Some good advice. Bianca D'Alessio, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks Great for having you here. Coming up, it's a box office blockbuster that's giving the movie industry some joy. That's right. Inside Out 2 came out on top big this weekend. The biggest domestic debut since Barbie, in mm. fact. So how the film's success could signal a big summer for theaters, we're going to take a look at that coming up on Morning News Now.
Welcome back. The king of country music is showing once again why he has earned that crown. George Strait set a new concert attendance record here in the U.S. Take a look at that. The country legend dusted off his signature cowboy hat and strummed to a crowd of more than 110,000 fans. Oh. At Texas A&M's Kyle Field over the weekend, it was smashing the record that was previously set by the Grateful Dead nearly 50 years ago, smashing it by several thousand people, proving that even the crowds are bigger in Texas. Oh, that's so awesome. Good for him. Yes, absolutely. Well, when it comes to movie theaters, although it didn't quite break a record, we finally do have our first major box office blockbuster of the year. Pixar's Inside Out 2 hit theaters over the weekend with huge numbers at the box office. The sequel brought in an estimated $155 million domestically, mm. making it the second highest theatrical opening of an animated film ever. It comes after one of the slowest starts to the summer movie season in decades. For more, we are joined by managing editor at Fandango, Eric Davis. Eric, as always, great to see you. So just tell us how much joy did joy and the other emotions bring this week and how big of a deal is this debut? It's a huge deal. This is the biggest opening of 2024, not just domestically, but also worldwide. Second biggest ever for an animated film, second biggest ever for Pixar. So it was a really big deal. We kind of saw this coming, though. This was featured in our most anticipated surveys multiple times for the year, for the summer. This is the highest performing title on Fandango's social media channels this year. Uh, certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, high audience score. So it really is this perfect storm of a film that speaks to multiple generations. And I think that really is the recipe here, is that you have kids, you have adults, you have Pixar, which is a beloved brand. All of it came together for uh, a little bit of history at the box office. Mm. So we gave you the domestic numbers. Globally, it's expected to bring in $295 million for the opening weekend. Does this show that the audience is still out there for big mm. movies? Or I kind of worry that maybe there's only a handful of movies every single year that can do this now. Well, I, I think you're always going to see ebbs and flows at the box office. That's just always going to be the case. I definitely think films like this do show you, though, that people want to get out and go to the movies. You know, I, I have two teenagers at home. If I have a quarter for every conversation we have about regulating your emotions, I'd be a very <laughs> rich man. And so I think movies like this that just appeal to wide audiences bring those audiences in. But that doesn't mean that you can't have smaller titles that also make a difference, awards-friendly titles that bring out a, a lot of people like Oppenheimer last year. So I definitely think we're, you know, people want to go to the movies. I think they want to go see certain kinds of movies that, you know, appeal to them. Between the pandemic, of course, and then also we had these strikes, the actors strike, the writers strike. I mean, movie theaters have struggled to make ends meet. There was a period where we didn't know if they were going to make it. How much does this lift kind of the industry as a whole when you have a, a big opening weekend? Is it sort of like this win is a win for all? Yeah, this win is definitely a win for all, you know, and I think we were saying similar things after Barbenheimer and then after Dune Part Two and then after Godzilla x Kong. you know, uh, yeah, it's definitely a win. And, you know, this brings a lot of people to theaters that maybe don't go as often to movie theaters. And then they, they're reminded, like, we should come here more often. This was mm. a fun time for the family. So, yeah, without a doubt, this is a, a great win for movie theaters. Look, this is a pastime that we don't want to lose you know it's not like if they said restaurants aren't doing well so we're closing all restaurants people would be like no no i want to go to the restaurants so <laughs> without a doubt i think this is a great thing so eric you know we have deadpool and wolverine due out in theaters next month beetlejuice beetlejuice in september <laughs> we only have 20 seconds left here but could either of these actually beat inside out to at the box office I, I think so, you know, and I mentioned that uh, social media for Inside Out 2 was the highest for Fandango this year. The second highest title is Despicable Me uh, 4, which comes out uh, in July. Third is Deadpool and Wolverine. So, hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of fans, a lot of movies coming out that a lot of fans want to see. Eric Davis, thank you very much. Always fun to have you. It's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Don't go anywhere. The news continues right now.
Good morning. Thanks for starting your week with us. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, summer scorcher. This morning, millions of Americans from coast to coast are waking up to dangerous heat alerts. Our Michelle Grossman is more on the heat dome that's got its eyes on the East Coast. In the Middle East this morning, Israel's tactical pause in fighting in Gaza. The IDF opting to pause the violence, but only during daylight hours to allow vital humanitarian aid to enter along a key route. You've got the latest in just a moment. Some good news from the royal family. Princess Kate making her official return to duties over the weekend after revealing a cancer diagnosis earlier this year. What she's now saying about her prognosis as she shares a touching Father's Day message to Prince William. Plus, Broadway's biggest night definitely did not disappoint. Later in the hour, the big winners from last night's Tony Awards, including, of course, the show that took home this year's coveted Best Musical. It was actually a year where it was unclear who was going to win that one, so it came down to the very end to see what it was going to be. I can't wait to learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Felicia here as well to walk yes. us through it. Looking forward to that. Let's begin, of course, this hour with the extreme weather that is sweeping across the country. Yeah, this morning, millions from coast to coast are bracing for another round of high temperatures this week as some areas are set to face their longest heat wave in decades. In California, the severe weather is fueling a series of brush fires over the weekend, damaging buildings and forcing evacuations. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the details. With the official start of summer still days away, the season is effectively already off and running. With the first official heat wave of 2024, this rain here in Detroit right now is effectively the last gasp of relief before temperatures soar to as much as 20 degrees above average across much of the country. This morning, the heat is on, with tens of millions from the Midwest to the East Coast bracing for the first major heat wave of 2024. Dreading it. You're dreading it. Yes. Syracuse set to hit 93 degrees, Chicago going up to 97, and several other cities are slated to shatter records. Detroit set to sizzle under intense heat. What did you think when you heard it was going to be in the 90s? I thought that's unusual for Michigan this time of the year, this early, to be so hot. The South already sweltering over the weekend. It's very hot. Um, we're just trying to stay in the shade. Drink lots and lots of water. In Atlanta, many Father's Day celebrations held inside. We'll go back and sit in the air conditioning and go from there. <laughs> While out west, the scorching temps fueling wildfires near L.A. This nearly 15,000 acre blaze in Gorman, forcing more than 1,000 people to evacuate from a nearby state park. A worker capturing the fire, consuming an auto shop. And in wine country, firefighters appear to be getting the upper hand on another destructive fire, fighting the flames from the air and on the ground. And making matters worse, the National Weather Service and a lot of places warning that overnight lows for days could hover near 80 degrees. That includes here in Detroit. And of course, that offers little relief to those without air conditioning. Mm. Back to you. All right, Maggie, thank you very much. Let's bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Now she's here with a check on your morning news now forecast for the week ahead. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And the big weather headline will, this week will be the dangerous heat. We're looking at days and days of heat. The nights are going to be uh, not as cool either, so we're not going to get the relief overnight. That will be the big weather headline. So that's from pretty much the Midwest, the Plains, into portions of the Great Lakes, the Ohio Valley, into the Northeast, also New England. Then on the flip side, in portions of the Northern Rockies, we're looking at accumulating snow. We have winter storms mornings there. Sandwiched in the middle, we have a severe threat in portions of the plain. Also parts of the upper Mississippi Valley could see some damaging winds. Some hail, a couple tornadoes are possible as well. And really heavy rainfall. Could see three inches per hour there. So we're concerned about a flood threat. Another flood threat would be along the Gulf Coast. We have a area of low pressure in the Gulf that could develop into a tropical depression. Regardless of if it does or even gets a name, uh, we're looking at some tropical moisture moving on shore. Anywhere from two to five inches of rain. Could see up to eight in some spots. So we're going to watch that over the next couple of days. By Wednesday, we're looking at that rain in portions of the Central Plains into the Midwest. There is that flood risk. Notice all those colors, those bright colors, indicating that we are expecting heavy rain there. Sunny and seasonal as we look at portions of the West, and then that dangerous heat does continue. This is prolonged. Again, if you don't have air conditioning, you want to take action now. You want to think about where you're going to go, the library, the movies, places where you have air conditioning, and, or get a fan if you uh, don't have a fan. Stay indoors if you can, if you're working, or find a tree. All those... Uh, 
uh, the tips that we hear about during these times. Rain continuing throughout the northern plains, also portions of the upper Midwest. Hot and humid in parts of the Tennessee Valley, also along the Gulf Coast. But notice that rain is continuing as well. Into Florida, uh, we're looking at more records breaking on Friday. This is going to be the toughest days in the mid-Atlantic, the northeast, New England, Thursday and Friday, where we could have feels like temperatures into the triple digits. So let's talk about that heat. Coast to coast, 90s, 100s, feeling warmer than that. Today, 150 million people experiencing highs over 90 degrees. That's anywhere from 10 to 25 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Keep in mind, it's still late spring. So this is the first heat wave of the season. That makes it even more difficult. Then as we uh, look at the 100 degrees, this is 100 or over. We're looking at 9 million people impacted, mainly in the southwest today in parts of the plains and also uh, the south central states. So we're looking at 66 million Americans under heat alerts. We have heat advisories, heat watches, heat warnings. This is really a heads up from the National Weather Service to say, hey, the heat is coming. You want to take action, get your plan in place over the next several days because this will be a long duration event. And this is why we're looking at temperatures into the 90s, well into the 90s in Chicago today. 96, the record there is, or 97, the record is 96. 92 in Pittsburgh, 93 in Syracuse. The heat continues tomorrow. Even gets a little worse in parts of the Northeast. This is going to kick off that heat wave uh, in the Northeast in New England. Burlington, Vermont, 97. The record there is 97. Uh, numbers in the 90s in Boston, Bangor, Newark, also Hagerstown, Morgantown, really all those temperatures in the 90s. And look at this, guys. We're looking into Thursday and Friday as well. And there are uh, models saying that this is going to go beyond into next wow. week as well. So this is just prolonged. That's really tough on the body. Mm -hmm. So you want to check on your neighbors, you know, keep the pets mm -hmm. indoors, all those things. Stay hydrated. I spent Stay the hydrated. weekend cleaning out the air conditioners, preparing that to, was good. Preparing to <laughs> Smart. Preparing have a busy week. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, it's going to be running. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Well, the race for the White House is heating up with now less than five months left until Election Day. And then, of course, we've got next week's debate. Over the weekend, President Biden stepped up his fundraising efforts by throwing a celebrity-filled event in Los Angeles. Angeles. His campaign says it raked in more than $30 million. His opponent, former President Trump, also hit the campaign trail, but in the battleground state of Michigan. NBC News Now anchor Helly Jackson has the details from Washington. Hey there, Joe and Savannah. Good morning to you both. A lot going on, too, as former President Trump focuses on a key swing state. And President Biden looks for an infusion of campaign cash on a night with many celebrities. But the biggest spotlight on warnings about what could happen if Mr. Trump wins again. At a star-studded L.A. fundraiser, By President way, Biden right. laying out the stakes By of a potential way, second watch. Trump term. The next president is likely to have two new Supreme Court nominees. The idea that if he's reelected, he's going to appoint two more flying flags upside down is really, uh, I, I, I really mean it. But look, the Supreme Court has never been as out of kilter as it is today. In a Q&A, comedian Jimmy Kimmel also asking about so-called Trump amnesia. Remember the pandemic, Mr. Biden responded. He said, just don't worry, just inject a little bleach in your body. Former President Obama also on hand, warning part of what has happened over the last several years is we've normalized behavior that used to be disqualifying. The fundraiser, hosted by Hollywood heavyweights Julia Roberts and George Clooney, netting a hefty haul with the Biden campaign saying it raised more than $30 million. The race for the White House effectively deadlocked less than five months from Election Day, with voters repeatedly signaling concerns over age. President Biden, 81 years old, Mr. Trump turning 78 Friday. Again, challenging President Biden to take a cognitive test. I took a cognitive test and I aced it. But Mr. Trump mixing up the name of the former White House physician who administered his own test back in 2018, Dr. Ronnie Jackson. Doc Ronnie. Doc Ronnie Johnson. Does everyone know Ronnie Johnson, congressman from Texas? He was the White House doctor. The former president campaigning in Battleground, Michigan, at a predominantly black church, part of his outreach to black voters, taking aim at President Biden over his central role in the controversial 1994 crime bill and seeking to fan the flames on illegal immigration. They're coming into your community and they're taking your job. We are also learning more about the rules for the first presidential debate, which is set to happen late next week. According to CNN, which is hosting, the candidates have agreed to two commercial breaks during which they're not allowed to talk with staff. Their mics will be muted when it's not their turn to speak. No props, no pre-written notes. The podium position will be determined by a coin flip. 
And there will not be a studio audience, Joe and Savannah, so things may look and sound a little different than they have for debates past. Mm -hmm. Joe and Savannah, back to you. All right, Hallie Jackson, thank you very much. Turning now to the continuing war in Gaza, Israeli military officials say they will not be fighting during daylight hours until further notice. The hope is that more humanitarian aid can be delivered to the region. Now, this news comes as Prime Minister Netanyahu faces new pressure to end the war. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us with the latest. Raf, good morning. Joe, good morning. A major shakeup here in Israel today as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announces he is dissolving the war cabinet, which has been responsible for managing the war effort these last eight months. Remember, this was kind of a team of rivals with political opponents joining Netanyahu's government immediately after the October 7th attack. But they have now resigned from the government because of disagreements over the handling of the war. And there is new tension between Israel army and its government over humanitarian aid for Gaza. Morning, a new phase of Israel's operation in Rafah is underway. The IDF says it's pausing fighting for 11 hours each day near a critical border crossing to allow more humanitarian aid into Gaza. The move announced during the Muslim holiday of Eid, Gazan families trying to celebrate among the ruins of war. There's no life. Gaza's destroyed. There's no Gaza anymore, nine-year-old Alma tells our team. Aid groups welcoming the decision and calling on Israel to do more to address the danger of famine. But the far right of Israel's government blasting the army, saying whoever made the decision to pause the fighting was a fool who should not continue in his position. And an Israeli official claiming Prime Minister Netanyahu was unaware of the decision and found it unacceptable, saying the fighting would continue in other parts of Rafah as planned. The Israeli leader also announcing he's dissolving the war cabinet after his main political rival resigned from the body last week. But over the weekend, Netanyahu facing new pressure as protesters in Tel Aviv demanded a deal to free the hostages, even if it means ending the war. And just a week after he was rescued from Gaza by Israeli commandos, freed hostage Andrei Kozlov speaking out. Israel, world, Hamas, I ask you to make a deal as soon as possible. And one of President Biden's top advisors will be here in Israel today to discuss not Gaza, but the intensifying fighting between Israel and Iranian-backed Hezbollah militants in Lebanon. The White House says it is doing everything it can to try to keep that fight from erupting into a full-scale war. Jeff. All right, Raf, thank you. Well, back here in the U.S., families in three states are grieving after multiple mass shootings this weekend. Michigan, Texas, and Massachusetts all had separate shootings that add to the more than 200 mass shootings across the country since the start of the year. With more on the deadly weekend is NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin. Hey there, a mass shooting at a splash pad in Michigan, another at a Juneteenth celebration in Texas, and yet another at a gathering in Massachusetts, all just days after Friday's Supreme Court ruling that rejects a ban on bump stocks. This morning, friends and families across the country are grieving after multiple mass shootings this weekend. Multiple victims from an active shooter. Deputies aren't on scene yet. In Rochester Hills, Michigan, a man opened fire at a splash pad, unleashing 28 rounds. The attack left nine injured, including children, some seriously wounded. An eight-year-old uh, boy who uh, has a gunshot wound to the head. Police say the suspect later shot himself and are investigating his motive. It was heartbreaking, saddening, devastating. Nothing like this has ever happened around this area. While in Round Rock, Texas, police are searching for a shooter who killed two and injured more than a dozen others at a Juneteenth celebration. These folks could care less about someone's life and took someone's life on, and on a day we're here to celebrate community. And at least eight people were injured by a shooting at a pop-up party in Methuen, Massachusetts, with two victims in critical condition. Here we see again gun violence that's striking at the heart of a community. So far this year, there have been 225 mass shootings in the U.S., according to the Gun Violence Archive. The weekend shootings come just days after the Supreme Court struck down a Trump-era ban on bump stocks. The gun accessories used to modify semi-automatic weapons so that they can fire faster. 
But this morning, many are just searching for answers. And our hearts go out to the victims and their families. These acts of senseless violence do not represent the values of our community. The shootings from over the weekend did not involve bump stocks to our knowledge, but experts say that if they did, they could have been so much worse. Back to you. All right, Erin McLaughlin, thank you so much. There's much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including all the winners and surprises from Broadway's Biggest Night. Looking forward to that, but first, Princess Kate back in the global spotlight this morning. After officially returning to royal duties over the weekend, we've got the latest on her health after she was diagnosed earlier this year with cancer. That's next. We're back now with a look at Princess Kate's much anticipated royal return. On Saturday, the Princess of Wales made her first public appearance since revealing her cancer diagnosis. She attended the annual Trooping the Color ceremony. NBC News international correspondent Kelly Covillea joins us now from Buckingham Palace with the latest. Kelly, good morning. Good morning to you, Joe. Yeah, the Trooping the Color, also known as the King's Birthday Parade, is one of the most important royal events of the entire year. And Princess Kate was here on that balcony for the iconic royal family appearance. Not just on the balcony, though, but here for the entire day with her children and telling the world she's making good progress. A royal return for Princess Kate. Smiling to the huge crowds from her carriage, surrounded by her children. Later, beaming on the Buckingham Palace balcony Saturday for the King's official birthday parade, sharing a moment with Prince William. It's the princess's first public appearance since announcing her cancer treatment earlier this year, a show of unity with King Charles, who has also undergone treatment for cancer. It's been such a challenging time for the royal family and to have everyone back together on the balcony, I think really reassured people that things are going in the right direction for both the king and for Kate. Princess Kate also releasing this picture and sharing a very personal statement Friday, saying she was making good progress, but admitting there are good days and bad days. On those bad days, you feel weak, tired, and you give in to your body resting. Adding, on the days I feel well enough, it's a joy to engage with school life, spend personal time on the things that give me energy and positivity. I think people have seen the princess speaking in a more personal and intimate way than ever before. She's opened up uh, in a way she never has done before and sharing her vulnerabilities as well as the positives, you know, in this journey. The palace sharing these tender moments behind the scenes of Kate with her children, who are also back in the spotlight for the first time in months. The family watching dad, Prince William, on horseback, part of the military pomp and circumstance. Six-year-old Prince Louis spotted yawning, then dancing. Big sister, Princess Charlotte, giving him a nudge. The youngest royals all making their social media debut with a touching post on Father's Day, saying, we love you, Papa. The palace said the picture was taken by Kate. Prince William posted his own Father's Day tribute to the king. Our thanks to Kelly for that report. Well, for more on Princess Kate's royal return, we are joined by NBC News royal contributor and royal correspondent at Vanity Fair, Katie Nichol. Katie, good morning. Great to see you as always. So this is a moment so many people have been waiting for. I mean, months without a public appearance from Princess Kate. So tell us, how did the British public receive this? How big was this moment? Well, they were delighted to see her, and it was something of a surprise. We hadn't expected her to be at Trooping, and um, it was her decision, I'm told, and she spoke to Prince William about it, spoke to the King about it, and they were fully behind her. Of course, she had to go out and get that green light from her medical team. I think it's just worth caveating all of this and making the point that this is not a return to full-time royal duties. We're not going to be seeing Catherine at, at engagements throughout the summer. I wonder if we might see her at Wimbledon. Of course, she's the president of the Lawn Tennis Association. She loves tennis and in that message that very poignant and personal message that she delivered on Friday she did talk about doing the things that bring her joy so we know there's been a bit of working from home she's being kept up to date with everything that her Royal Foundation and the Early Years Foundation are doing tennis is something that brings her joy being nature is something that brings her joy so I think she's going to be very selective about what she does but being here on this balcony on Saturday was really important to her to be there for her children to be there for the country and to be there for the King Hmm. As important as ever to focus on the things that bring her joy. So, mm -hmm. Katie, Princess Kate's appearance came after she gave us that update on her cancer treatment Friday. It was a post on social media. She said she was making good progress. 
How did it appear she's holding up? I mean, did this appearance calm concerns that may have been brought on during this long period where we didn't see her or hear from her? Well, there has just been so much speculation about her health. I mean, this was the first time that she'd been seen in public since Christmas Day, um, which is frankly extraordinary. And, you know, the, the nation, I think, and, and beyond have really felt her absence. She wasn't at the D-Day landing. She wasn't at things that we sort of would have loved to have seen her at. So I think it was very important for her to be at Trooping. But as I say, this, this doesn't necessarily herald the, the return to public life. In that statement, she said she is still undergoing chemotherapy. We don't know what sort of cancer treatment she's going through, but it's going to be a time before we see her back to full time. She's also not the only member of the royal family battling cancer, of course. This year's ceremony was slightly different, actually. This was to help accommodate the king, this birthday parade. But while he has had these medical concerns as well, how are King Charles, Prince William and, and the other royals managing at this time? Well, they are managing it. I hear that the king is doing very well, that he's tolerating the treatment well. I think that's evident in everything that we're seeing him doing. But, you know, he's he's in his 70s, um, a huge amount of pressure on him. And, and at this time, he really needs those who the late queen referred to as his substitutes. And, of course, the Princess of, of Wales is one of those, not just one of the most popular members of the royal family, but one of the most important as well. You ask about Prince William, and I think we mustn't forget him in all of this. He's shouldering a lot. He's got a father going through cancer treatment, a young wife going through cancer treatment it's been very much down to him to pick up the mantle all right katie nickel thank you very much for joining us more international news now in saudi arabia more than a dozen people have died in triple digit heat during the hajj pilgrimage to mecca claudia luanga joins us from rome with that and more hey claudia good morning <coughs> Good morning. Well, that's right. This year's Islamic pilgrimage of the Hajj is uh, coming once again to its conclusion with the last ritual involving pilgrims throwing stones at pillars representing the devil. Now, an estimated 1.8 million people took part in the Hajj this year amid the soaring summer heat, as you mentioned. Now, according to Saudi Arabia's health ministry, more than 2,700 pilgrims suffered from heat stroke on Sunday alone. And officials in Jordan say at least 14 Jordanian pilgrims have died from sunstroke during the Hajj. Now let's go to Russia, where authorities announced that the espionage trial of the Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich will begin on June 26th. The trial will be held in the regional court in Yekaterinburg, more than 800 miles from Moscow, where he was originally arrested. In a statement, the court said the trial will be closed to the public, as it's usual in espionage cases. The reporter, the Wall Street Journal, and the U.S. government deny the allegations. And let's end this tour of the world in Mexico, where Sunday wrestlers join forces to raise awareness of climate change. Lucha Libre, Spanish for free fighting, is one of Mexico's most popular sports, and its fighters, with their colorful masks and costumes, have a massive following. But this time, the wrestlers decided not to fight each other, but to come together to knock down climate change instead. Now, they also had signs in Spanish saying, every drop counts. They meant of water, not of blood, of course. Back to you guys. <laughs> it's a good message right there. All right. Claudio, thank you very much. Coming up, the official start to summer is finally here. And for millions of Americans, that means packing up and heading to, hopefully, paradise. This travel season is already shaping up to be one for the record books. So what do you need to know before you head out the door? We've got you covered up next. Welcome back. I know it's felt like summer for a while, but this week actually marks the official beginning of summer, and it is already projected to be a record-breaking year for air travel. The TSA says that last Friday was its second busiest day ever for airport screenings, with number one being the Friday before Memorial Day. That was just a few weeks ago. In fact, if you look at the top 10 busiest days of all times, for, of all time for airports. Seven of them happened this year. That's pretty amazing. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is live at Miami International Airport. Sam, good morning. I was traveling on Friday. It was not fun. <laughs> I got home six oh, hours after I was tonight. supposed to. Uh, first and foremost, tell us why are people flying more than ever this year? 
Guys, obviously because they love delays and not enough yeah. staffing on these airlines. Uh, no, I think we've all experienced what it's like to travel right now. That said, there is so much demand, and it's for a multitude of reasons. One of them is strictly behavioral, really. Post-pandemic, people just have this craving and urge to travel, uh, and also the pricing. Let's start then with the pricing. Look at your screen right now. Year over year, this probably is going to shock you guys, but Joe and Savannah, down 5.9% from May this year to May a year ago, and then down about a percent in terms of the cost of airfare from pre-pandemic levels, May 2019. You think about what inflation has done to everything from gas to cars to groceries to housing, and somehow airfare is cheaper than it was before the pandemic. That's a big driver. And then the other thing is the International Air Transport Association, the IATA, did a survey and found that about 33% of people say they're traveling more now than they did before the pandemic. And look at this next number. 44% plan to travel more in the next 12 months than in the previous 12 months, which is to say if past is prologue, expect more people at airports now, not fewer, guys. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think something's wrong with my internet browser or something. I only find expensive flights, oh. but everybody <laughs> is finding these deals. So Sam, tell us, what are these destinations that people are headed to this summer? What's most popular? Savannah, glad that you asked. So I'm in Florida, and Florida has three of the top 10 destinations across the country, according to AAA. That is Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, and Orlando, the number one travel destination in the United States. Yes, those theme parks are still a thing. Because look, Anaheim is number two, guys. Las Vegas, New York, Denver, Atlanta, Phoenix, rounding out the top 10. But those are just uh, sort of a snapshot there of where people are traveling right now. Hawaii, of course, very popular as well. Mm. So, Sam, you can't control the weather. You can't control how many people are working for the airlines. But are there some travel hacks, things we can control to prepare for our trips and avoid the worst of the traffic? 100 percent. And we would start with this. Check the luggage requirements for your airlines to see size mm. and weight. How many carry-ons are you allowed to take on? Do you get any free checked bags? Because if you have that information wrong, it can really stall and or cost you money when you get to the airport. Keep essentials in carry-ons like medicine and glasses, because if you're separated from your bag, you do not want to have to go through that hassle. Arrive at least two hours early. That's what they preach. I mean, how many of us can actually practice that is another question. Consider TSA pre-check. It does save a ton of time. And here's a big one. Wear easy to remove shoes because mm -hmm. no one wants to be that guy or lady when you're in the security line and you're just trying to get all your stuff in there and the metal detector keeps going off and like, oh, sir, I'm sorry, you have to take off your shoes. <laughs> you know, that's just a pain. So sounds like you're speaking your from well, experience, so flows Sam. More smoothly. <laughs> Never happened to me, not one time. I'm just saying I've seen other people make that mistake. It was so before. detailed. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> and then they do it again. And then <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Sam, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, speaking of traveling, United Airlines pilots are giving some HBCU students a unique opportunity in an effort to increase diversity in aviation. Janelle Finch with our affiliate in Denver, KUSA, has the details. Behind aeronautical charts and dozens of buttons is the next generation of pilots ready for takeoff. In three, two, one, you're flying. These future flyers want to make a difference with their time in the sky. I think with any pilot, every single time you get on the flight deck, you always want to like peek in and be like, who's here? What's going on? <laughs> but I want to say thank you to United. Students from six HBCUs are changing statistics with United Airlines. Of the airline's pilots and other frontline workers in 2023, 18.2% are Hispanic Latino, 15.1% are black, and 48.1% are white. It's progress from 40 years ago when Michael Bonner started flying. I knew at an early age that flying airplanes is what I wanted to do for a living. He was used to being one of the only in his profession. He knows there's still a way to go. Ask for more. Try to be more now as you're learning to be that aviation manager or that pilot, that professional pilot, um, and take advantage of every opportunity that you have to engage with those that do look like you, that are doing what you want to do. Uh, don't pass up on any of those opportunities. As a retiring pilot, he's prepared to pass off his wings. Eliana Rothwell is studying to take over. Yeah, absolutely motivating, yeah. She's on the pilot track at Delaware State University. I love the landings. It's always a little bit of a challenge, but if you get the perfect landing, it just feels so magical. All right, reverse down. 
She says overcoming industry standards are both her challenge and motivation. But it's that feeling of maybe I don't belong here, and that's, again, why events like this are so beneficial, is to see people that look like me, that are me, that are in the flight deck, that are achieving the careers that I aspire to be in. It's inspiring and motivating to keep chasing my dreams. Even though she's looking up to the professionals around her, she's already inspiring aviators, looking up to her. So lots of times I feel like, oh, I'm not there yet. But then I'll have a little girl, she'll be like, oh my gosh, you're working on your flight instructor rating. And I'm like, oh wait, I actually am helping the statistics out. So it is really great to be a part of it. The skies are ready for the next, next generation too. <laughs> Next, next. Our thanks to Janelle Finch for that report. Well, United says 30 of its pilots took part in the event. Some who are HBCU grads. Very cool to see. For Team USA, it was a huge weekend in the pool that was built just for them. At the <laughs> U.S. Olympic swimming trials in Indianapolis, they turned a football stadium into an aquatic center and hosted the nation's best swimmers who were competing for a shot at the Paris Games. Some big names are headed back to the Olympics, joined by some bright young swimming stars who are already owning the competition. NBC News News correspondent Jesse Kirsch was at Lucas Oil Stadium for all the excitement. Jesse, good morning. Hey guys, good morning. It was electric in here over the weekend. Here's how all of these final races have started. Look at these massive monitors. This is the tunnel through which all of the swimmers come out for those finals. Their names are announced to the crowd. The crowd's been going wild. And then they walk out into this massive space, an NFL arena. Take a look at how much room there is in here, filled with people cheering them on to Paris. This morning, the U.S. Olympic swim trials making a historic splash. Five American swimmers already clinching their spots on Team USA, including superstar Katie Ledecky, who's heading to her fourth straight Olympics after a decisive win in the women's 400-meter freestyle. In the men's 400, 19-year-old Aaron Shackle's win made him a first-time Olympian. His dad competed for Great Britain in 1996. Ever since I learned my dad was an Olympian, I always wanted to be an Olympian myself. It's unbelievable, to be honest. 22-year-old Carson Foster won the men's 400 individual medley after just missing the cut for Tokyo. I have so many, probably 25 family and friends sitting in the stands, and I know I don't wish I could just jump that fence and go hug them. Nick Fink won the men's 100-meter breaststroke, earning his second trip to the Olympics. After the victory, the soon-to-be dad celebrating with a rock the baby motion on Father's Day. His pregnant wife emotional in the crowd. But the weekend's biggest winner might be Gretchen Walsh. In the women's 100-meter butterfly semifinal Saturday, the 21-year-old set a new world record. What was coming through your mind when you realized what you just done? I mean, I feel like my reaction kind of said it all. Like, literally no words. All just raw emotion of being like, what the heck just happened? Then on Sunday, she won the final, becoming a first-time Olympian. After the win, she embraced her older sister, Alex, a Tokyo silver medalist, hoping to clinch a spot on Team USA again this year. I think we both learned so much from each other. USA Swimming says on Saturday there were more than 20,000 people in the stands here making this the largest ever indoor swim meet. Step one for the swimmers, finish first in that pool, and step two if you do that, sign the board. And get ready for Paris. Guys, back to you. <laughs> All right, those names are starting to fill up there. Jesse, thank you so much. Looks like a fun one. Coming up, it's high school graduation season, and that means millions of new grads are about to head off to college. For some parents, that can definitely be a hard thing to grapple with, becoming a so-called empty nester. So mm -hmm. how can families cope? We've got some tips coming up. Back now with some financial headlines. McDonald's is removing automatic order taking from drive through CNBC Savannah Hanau joins us with that. Another news, Savannah, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning to you. Yeah, McDonald's is reportedly firing its artificial intelligence drive through chatbot. Well, at least for now. Trade publication Restaurant Business says the fast food giant told franchisees it is ending its AI partnership with IBM no later than July 26. Now, the tech will be removed from the more than 100 restaurants that are using it. But McDonald's didn't dismiss the prospect of more drive through AI, telling Restaurant Business it still sees an opportunity to explore voice ordering solutions more broadly. Iconic late night eatery Waffle House is boosting worker pay to at least $3 an hour. 
The CEO called the move the single largest additional investment in Waffle House's workforce in its 68-year history. Servers will see the change this month. Then wages will go up to $5.25 an hour by June 26. The, best, the base pay, which is also known as tipped minimum wage, does not include tips. The CEO says the chain will hike menu prices to cover the pay raise. And Savannah, this one's for you. England's war on inflation could suffer, be, uh, suffer a blow because of Taylor Swift's record-shattering Eras Tour. Hundreds of thousands of fans will flock to London in August to see Swift during her final UK dates. And strategists at investment bank TD Securities say the temporary surge in hotel prices could be enough for the Bank of England to defer a possible September interest rate cut. The economic impacts of the sold-out tour have been well documented across the globe. In a separate note, Barclays Bank said the full UK tour could add an estimated $1 billion to the British economy, guys. I absolutely believe it. All right, yep. Her next Taylor album Swift is effect. going to be called Inflation. All right, <laughs> Silvana, thank you so much. Sure. Well, as the school year comes to a close, millions of new grads are getting ready to head off to college. That means more parents are going to be empty nesters, which can be a tough but rewarding and exciting time. We want to welcome Laura gassner Otting. She is the author of the book Wonder Hell, Why Success Doesn't Look Like It Should and What to Do About It. And she helps people make big strides and adjustments. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I remember so clearly when I went to college that it was really tough for my parents adjusting to this. And so for so many families, this is going to be the last summer that they're spending all all together, how can they make the most of that time? Well, I think we have to remember to embrace our feelings, right? To feel all those emotions. I'm in Gen X, so, you know, my parents were boomers. They sent us out to the street. They said, drink from the yep. garden hose, come back where the lights are dark. <laughs> but as a Gen Xer, we overcorrected. So we were super involved in our kids' activities. Their hobbies became ours. And mm. it kind of feels a little bit like we're losing our best buddies when they leave. Mm. Let's fast forward then to September. Kids are settled into their dorm rooms. Parents are trying to now figure out new routines. What are some of the important things they should keep in mind during that process? So we get all this advice at graduation, mm -hmm. like the world's your oyster for our kids. Kids, but it turns out the world's our oyster mm. too. So as we're watching them setting up their dorm rooms and being themselves and figure out who they are in this new iteration, we should remember that for us, it's also a chance for reinvention. Mm. So we should think about, you know, we got that title of parent that was added to all the other titles we have. So what about those other titles. Maybe we want to go back. Maybe we want to figure out what really matters to us now and give ourselves the grace to decide that some things may be more important or less important. And now that we don't have all that time being spent on making dinner and buying prom dresses and going to sports mm -hmm. events, we can actually rediscover who we are. Mm, really good advice. Um, so then kids leave. Parents are like, come back, come visit me. Or I want to come visit you. How can parents kind of set expectations so that they're allowing their young adults to live life on their own terms and kind of make those decisions that work best for them, but still let their kids know they want to see them? Well, we have to let them make some mistakes, of course, right? There's big mistakes and small mistakes. So let your kids make some of the smaller mm -hmm. mistakes. Let them spread their wings. Let them fly. But also remember that our kids are kind of parent stars. The only, the only adults oh. they get to see are the college professors, and they see them like a couple hours a week. So I'm not above bribery. I go to school, <laughs> I take the kids and all of their friends out to just a restaurant just a little nicer than the cafeteria. Yeah. Doesn't cost a lot of money. And you actually get to spend time seeing them and watching who they are as they become these real humans. Are there some good rules or guidelines for how often a parent should visit during that first year or the kid should come home? I mean, how do you kind of handle having the right balance? I think it depends on the kid. So I've got two kids. They're in two different schools. One I see all the time. One I rarely see. You know, I have to honestly, I send them pictures of our puppy. Because if your kids are not responding to you, the best way to get an answer is to send them a picture of the dog. And then they're like, oh, cute. And you're like, great. They're still alive. So I think you have to just watch what they say. Like, let them, they're never going to say, I want to come home. But they may say things like, I miss you. And so then you can lob out an invitation. And so let them really guide the relationship, but make sure that you're always keeping the door open so that when they want to come home, they hint hard enough that you can actually figure that out. Mm. Laura, great advice. What a great conversation. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So All right, coming up, Broadway's biggest night did not disappoint. After the break, we'll bring you the winners and the surprises from last night's Tony Awards. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Singer Nick Jonas is headed to the Great White Way. That's right. The Jonas brother is teaming up with the Tony Award winning actress Adrienne Morin to headline the first ever Broadway production of the last five years. The show will be directed by Whitney White, who previously directed the show Jaja's African Hair Breeding, which Joe featured on his series Flipping the Script just last year. The last five years is a two person show. It's based off of the book written by Jason Robert Brown. It follows an aspiring actress and a writer as they fall in and out of love over the span of five years. You could say he's hot, she's cold, she's got him on his toes. That's a Jonas reference. You can catch the burning <laughs> up singer breaking a leg, so to speak, next spring. I love the music from that show. I didn't realize it's never actually been on Broadway. There was like a movie made about right. it with Hannah Kendrick a few years ago. Yeah. So That's good right. to see that. Excited for that. We're going to end the hour with Broadway's biggest night. One of Joe's biggest <laughs> yes, nights. Yes, my the biggest night. The 77th <laughs> annual Tony Awards capped off this weekend in New York City's Lincoln Center. Serial Phonic was one of the big stars of the night, taking home the most awards. And it was exciting to see Several familiar faces from last night. Many of the winners made appearances right here on Morning News Now. A couple just last week. Yeah. That includes Keisha Lewis from Hell's Kitchen, Shayna Taub from Suffs, and Justin Peck from Illinois. Broadway writer and content creator Felicia Fitzpatrick joins us now with more on what was really yes. a cool night. There were so many shows this year. Yes. So winning this year was like a huge deal. It was. L let's start with the big categories. You let's. got the best musicals categories, two of those, and the best plays. Mm -hmm. Who ended up winning? Well, I thought about you last night because it was his big night. I know that. <laughs> because of Merrily We Roll Along winning Best Revival yes. of a Musical. You know, it had such a big redemption arc in the uh, in 1980s. It was Stephen Sondheim's, like, famous flop. But then yeah. they won last night, which was a big deal. Um, appropriate one for Best Revival of a Play. I love Brendan Jacob Jenkins, so I was very excited for him. And then The Outsiders won Best Musical. And when I was here talking about the nominations, there wasn't a clear front runner for no. that race. And even last night when they announced it, there was not a clear. It, at that point, it could have been Hell's Kitchen, Outsiders, or even Suffs. Yes. And so yes. no one really knew who was going to win. Until that envelope was open, we did not know. Yeah. But you guys are, like, speaking to <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. I love it. But it, well, it, it is exciting, though, because you never know. There's so much artistry each year, and it's exciting to see it all celebrated. But best play, I think everyone knew, was going to be Stereophonic. Yes. Um, it was a fan fave, and it Duh. walked into the... Right? <laughs> Savannah knew. And it walked in with 13 nominations, um, the most ever for any play in history. So I think people knew it had a, a good choice, a good chance, excuse me, for, for best play. And we just profiled them within mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks. A fantastic show there. Yeah, everything we've done on the show, I know about. See, there you go. That's <laughs> and a, that's there was a, a lot good, of yeah. winners last a lot night. Of them. Yeah, so I do, show. I know, I have a list of point. primer, yeah. Yes. What about winners when it comes to the acting categories? Well, Keisha Lewis, who was on the show, mm -hmm. she won another 40-year storyline. She made her Broadway debut 40 years ago. Literally 40 years night. Saturday. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And I loved her speech. She said, if you can hear my voice, listen to me when I say don't give up. And I was mm. like, that's such a beautiful message. Mm -hmm. um, Carrie Young did win, and she had been nominated for the last three seasons, making history as the first uh, black actor to do so. So she clinched the win last night for her performance in Pearly. And then Daniel Radcliffe for all the Harry Potter fans. Yeah. Finally <laughs> then, gets you know his. What? Got, got a, his, his Tony win um, for Merrily We Roll Along. But what I loved about Daniel was like, he, he was not Harry Potter on stage. He mm. was his role, which was really mm. exciting to He's see. He's a little nervous mm. or whatever. Yeah. Will, Will Brill was on there too. I went to the stereophonic party last night yes. and saw him coming in and celebrating. Oh, and I'm so, sure. it was uh, so fun. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing performance. It was like for the Broadway him. insider of yeah. all Broadway insiders. We should look what, in any other acting categories. We have the. the oh, yeah, I took notes. I have my Steve Kornacki notes. Um, <laughs> well, also, so Keisha's co star, Malia Joy Moon, yep. won the leading actress for um, her role in Hell's Kitchen. And I mean, all of these categories wow. were stacked, right? So it was I mean, these are all huge these names. Yeah, Jeremy Strong, Strong, Sarah, yeah Paulson. Sarah Paulson. And Jonathan Groff was really sweet because he is such a theater kid. Yeah. And he Aww. talked about how he used to record the Tonys like growing up and watching the performances back. And he's like, I'm so honored to be here, like, making theater and celebrating with all of you. So I love that, that moment for him. Really that cute. was a moment. There were a few other standout moments during the night, right? Yes. So Shayna Taub, I, on Playbill, they said that she made history as the first woman to win both uh, Best Book and Best Score for Suffs mm. this year. And then Dede um, Ayite, she was the first black woman to win for costume design, which was oh. exciting for Jaja's um, African hair braiding. And then, of course, me as a millennial, I loved Alicia Keys and Jay-Z performing for Hell's Kitchen. Okay, that is cool. Empire State of Mind in New York. I just... 
I, I was living. It was so exciting. But they had a lot of um, st star-studded introductions because Hillary Clinton introduced Suffs because she's a producer on that. Angelina Jolie is a producer for The Outsiders, and she introduced their performance. Hmm. Um, and then Pete Townshend did the Who's yes. Tommy and played during their performance. Played during the Who's performance. Tommy. It was like wandering across the stage as he was performing. Yeah, and I was here for it. It was like nothing like my theater, you know? <laughs> exactly. The Alicia Keys thing with Jay, I mean, Jay Z, mm. that was um, unreal. People were going crazy. And you could tell that. Alicia just has loved being a part of the theater community mm -hmm. for this season and so getting to see her perform and sing with Malia who ended up winning um, that was really special too mm. so God. many good shows but how fun yeah. to have that song performed in New York on such a yeah. big New York night yeah now, what are you going to see first yeah I, Suffs I do want to see Suffs is fantastic and yeah. you told me about that yeah. it's great well it's great. and the and the winners yes yeah. Outsiders yeah. Is, we'll have a yeah. long yeah. list that was this my summer. pick for, for best musical yeah there yeah. You go. see so many to see <laughs> Felicia Fitzpatrick as always thank you so much it was a fun night thanks for having me that is going to do it for this hour morning news now don't go anywhere the news continues right now thanks for watching stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the nbc news app or follow us on social media